Ja? Dann gehen wir aufs Wissen. Ja. Klar. So I think ISIS will do something over here. The answer is I would be very surprised if they don't. They've already started, and, and it, take this as a rule of thumb, by the way. If something is reported as a single event, there are probably 50 of them happening. And the reason I say that is in part because, and I can tell you this from experience, if you find one, you know you're not finding 10. And second, if they're reporting, if the system is reporting one for a whole bunch of very good reasons, they're probably not reporting 10 also. Ongoing investigations, sting operations, what intelligence, whatever. Okay? So if they picked up a guy last week in was it Ohio? No. I've been, I, I've been traveling for the past week, I don't know what time zone I'm jet lagged in. But there was a, a recent arrest of a guy who was trying to recruit people to ISIS here, okay? So he wasn't too bright, he was doing it on Facebook. <laughs> uh, but if, if that guy is doing that, my guess is that there are others out there. So that becomes a matter of time. The Boston Marathon bombing, that sort of thing, those, those are the, the, the first hints. I will say this, and I, I, say, that, I, I say this cautiously, um, and again, easily misquoted, so please don't. These organizations, including the guys on Friday night in Paris, on the one hand, they are extremely deadly. On the other hand, they're not super competent either. Okay, and I, I don't want to go into details, especially if this is going to be broadcast, but let it be sufficient to say that an attack on that scale on a, a city that packed on a Friday night, and I don't wish this on, on anybody, so I don't want to be misquoted that way either, uh, they could have killed a lot more people if they knew they were doing. So, again, tragedy, and I'm not poo pooing it, certainly, but it's here, it's, it's going on. I can also tell you the law, the law enforcement intelligence security is working around the clock, and they're breaking up a lot of things, and not only breaking up, but just by working it, making it more difficult for them to, to do what they're doing. But you know what the, the problem in this business, um, and, and it's a real problem, it's, it's a systemic as well as psychological problem. The definition of a good day is a day when nothing happens. How many good days do you have, and then something happens and everybody forgets about all the good days. You know, where were you? Yeah, Paris, for example. Where were the security guys? What do you think's been going on for the past, you know, how many days, years? Whatever. So it's it's a matter of time before they before they have a new day. Well, sir, what what has uh, America has always given to Israel? What has Israel contributed to the world? America's given to Israel. What has Israel contributed to the world? It's almost the same thing. We're, we're constantly giving and not getting. So what, what, what does Israel contribute? Um, and, and we're, I can give you a spiritual answer, but I'm, I'm not, that's not what you're asking. Um, so let me answer on two levels. The sort of the, the general level of what Israel does, and then the specific level, level of Israel in the United States. So you, I don't know if you're familiar with the movement underfoot called BDS, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, Boycott Israel Products. And there are many of us in Israel who say, you know what, you want to boycott Israel products? Really? Boycott Israel products. Go ahead. Do it. But be honest. Be honest. You can boycott Israel products. Hand in your cell phones. Hand in your laptops. Anything with an Intel chip in it is mine now. Because that's where it comes from. Microsoft is moving its entire cyber operations to Israel. So any internet security that you do, anything, stop using it. Medical technology, stop using it. CAT scans, no, no, those are ours. Et cetera. Israel, tiny Israel, it's kind of funny because 
If you don't know, I have to say this sort of as an aside. But on one, hand, on one level, Israel is living proof that God has a sense of humor. I mean, really, the promised land? Physically, what are we talking about? We're talking about a land that's about 250 miles north-south, about 50 miles east-west at its widest point. Okay, in other words, there's no place in Israel where it would be 30 miles from the border. Our natural resource that the country is completely filled with is limestone rock. <laughs> If the world limestone market ever takes off, we're set for life. But until then, nothing. Our largest above ground water reservoir is the Dead Sea. Are you getting this picture? Half the country is desert all year round, and the other half is desert half the year. <laughs> it's a lousy neighborhood. And all of the oil in the region miraculously stops when it reaches our borders. That's the promised land. There's a famous anecdote about Moses on Mount Sinai the last day before he comes down. And God says to him, you know, you've been so patient and studious and good. I'm going to make you a one-time offer. Where do you really want the promised land? Your choice right now. Man. Tell us. And Moses thinks for a minute and thinks again and thinks to himself, Canada. <laughs> Oceans, forests, resources, reasonably good neighbors. But you know that Moses stuttered. <laughs> so when he went to say Canada, he came out Canada. <laughs> so in that ridiculously small, resourceless, waterless desert surrounded by enemies, with a population of 8 million people, Israel is the country with the third largest number of companies on the NASDAQ, after the United States and Canada. Okay. I think you get the point on that level. You might be surprised at how much of what you have around you is made in Israel. That's on the, on the general level. On the specific level. We train American forces in mutual. We sell equipment to the United States, it's also mutual. We test American equipment, and unlike many of America's friendly allies, we actually give the information to the United States. That's not universal. Even as recently as the Russian airliners crash being blown up by terrorists, this was even reported that much of the information the United States was getting about the attack was coming from Israeli intelligence. On that level, it's a bargain. And I know you've heard me say it, that I don't, I don't see that we're simply an alliance, it's a friendship. Friendships transcend alliances. And in friendship, there are times when you do things that actually might be detrimental to you because it's good for a friend. Having said that, friends can disagree, sometimes violently, not physically violently, but vehemently. Um, and it can get nasty, and sometimes the closer the friendship, the nasty the argument. And that doesn't make it a good thing. I don't want to make it sound like it's a good thing. But friendships usually transcend that as well. Uh, part of the problem that we have, and I say we, I mean all of us, is that in that immediate world of CNN, and again, I'm talking about the whole phenomenon, there's no context. So whatever happens today becomes the story of forever until a new story comes along. And it's never in the, in the context of except for this and this and this. There are a million exceptions, and I can give you the, the sensation story of the day. So, the truth is that the American Israeli relationship has developed closely over the past 
four and a half decades, but much, much, much more closely, I would say, in the last 20 years. But as, as relationships tend to do, they either get closer or split ours is up much, much closer. And clearly, in a two way, relationship doesn't go one way. Suggest for us Americans what we need to do. What do you do? Yeah, what do we need to do? Excellent. Thank you. I should have told you to tell me that before, but I have to think about it. <laughs> no, think about making sure that somebody asked that question. Um, just trying to think of how best to approach the answer. Let me start with this. I know this is going to come as a tremendous shock to you, but America is a democracy. The, the power, the facetious part was the shock. You know that America is a democracy. The power of decision making in the United States of America ultimately sits in rooms just like this. And if you think otherwise, you are abdicating your responsibility as citizens of a democracy. And therefore, you have the following obligations as far as I'm concerned. Obligation number one, learn this subject. Learn it. It's not just about saying I support Israel, that's nice. But if you want to know what to do, then you have to learn it. Having learned it, teach it. Learning, if we had this discussion in the car, learning without teaching is a waste. It's selfish. It's egotistical. To learn and not teach is pure selfishness. So if you know it and you believe it, teach it. Who should you teach? Everybody. Everybody, whether they like it or not. It means talking about it. It means talking about it to your friends, to your neighbors and to your elected representatives. You have enormous power in that, beyond anything you might believe. I can tell you, as somebody who's been involved in political activism, a phone call to your elected representative has enormous impact because they have a way of scoring. You say, oh, what's one phone call? They know. A form letter is worth X, 
An email is worth two X or three. A phone call is worth whatever it's worth. A visit to their office is worth 10 times that. And a visit to their office in Washington, especially coming from here, is worth a thousand times that. Why? Because they do a very, very quick, quick and simple calculation. If you care enough to pick up the phone and call, you're probably talking about this to other people as well. You're probably turning this into a voting issue, because that's all they really care about. And it doesn't take that many votes to, to overturn an election. Some of them are really, really close. So, learn it. And if you want to know how to learn best, come to Israel. But you can learn from here as well, better than ever. You can attest to that, I think. Learn it, teach it, talk about it, act on it. Other than that, really nothing to do. Genocide against the Palestinians. And the 
We've been doing it for 60 years. So I says, how come there aren't, how come there are still some left? <laughs> how come, in fact, over the 60 years of Israeli genocide, the Palestinian population has increased by a thousand percent? This is the most inefficient genocide in the history of humanity. <laughs> how come after all of the decades of expansionism, Israel is only the size of New Jersey? The, the, the labels are easy to throw out. The question is physically on the ground, is that what it shows? And the answer is, no it doesn't. Because if it did, what we're seeing wouldn't be. Israel is a powerful country, how come we have withdrawn from more territory in the course of making agreements and not, than the size of the country? Okay. This is weird behavior for an expansionist country. We take territory in a war that was basically defensive because they started, and we take more territory than the size of the country, and then we, in other words, we, we triple the size or quadruple the size of the country, and then we give all of that back. It doesn't match the label. So, I would say, so in, in conclusion to that, Go past the labels. When somebody says Israel's the aggressor, how is Israel the aggressor? And more to the point, why is the behavior that's being labeled as the aggress as aggressive behavior happening at all? There is this unfortunate tendency, and we see it even in, the, in mainstream media, to report things not exactly as they should be. How's that for a glaring understatement? Um, so, Israeli police shoot two Palestinians in Israeli violence. The two Palestinians happen to be in the process of knifing Israelis, but let's not get, you know, get into the details. Israel executes 13-year-old boy. That was a 13-year-old boy who stabbed the other 13-year-old. Executes him in the street, except that he's, in, he's no longer in the hospital, he's been discharged. He's in a hospital, in an Israeli hospital, being treated for the wounds that he received after getting hit by a car fleeing the police after stabbing a 13-year-old boy. So we're not going to be executing him. There, there's, there's something in the storytelling that's missing. It's called facts. And the social media picks up on it. Well, China, there, there's prophecy for you. I don't know. Um, look, China, China's a very interesting case, and it's really a subject in, in and of itself. All I'll say is this. China traditionally, and we can talk about tradition, thousands of years, is an Asian imperial power, and it has never really shown great aspiration to go beyond that. Does that mean that it can't? I'm not saying. Does it have commercial interests? Yes, traditionally it has had global commercial interests. There was trade, by the way, between Europe and China 2,000 years ago. So, where does you know, financial global become military global? Uh, if I had a guess, and this is one, don't come back to me two years and say you said this. If I had a guess, I would say no, not particularly, except to secure their economic position. Uh, they'll buy resources, I think, sooner than conquer. This is very easy. Can I suggest reliable news sources? What is Messiah telling?
for the classic journalistic W's. Who, what, when, where, and not why. They don't know why. We don't know what's going I've also trained myself in this next discipline because they're working to overcome this discipline. To get that information and then shut it off. Okay? Now, this is a tricky business because even, let's say, with what happened in Paris, you know what, let, let, let's go back to one that's, that's much further back, 9-11. We were in 9-11. In fact, 9-11 was over on 9-11. Now, at the time, we didn't really know. In other words, there's an element here of maybe, right, here we were surprised by, and by the way, in Israel just as much, just it was later in the day, right? But we were surprised by the event. Even those of us who weren't, who weren't surprised, you know, that it happened, in the sense of an attack, that but we were surprised that when it happened. And here we had one, one plane, two planes, three planes, four planes. Is there a fifth plane, six planes, six, you know, or is something else going to happen? So there's always that kind of sense of, okay, I want to keep my ear to the, you know, to the news. Has it entered now? We don't know that. And I can tell you, not just from the news, but from having lived through a few historical events as a participant, uh, you know it's over usually two or three days after it. That, that's a reality. Having said that, once the magnitude of what has happened is clear, I'm intentionally using the word magnitude, and let me I'll use the Paris example that was much closer and more finite. The casualty numbers started to float into the 120s, the 150s, even 200, and then we're scaled back to 120. Now let's be serious, I, 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 I want to be understood in the right context. Every person who did or didn't die is a tragedy that did or didn't happen. Right? Here I'm, I'm not belittling any of them. But as a news consumer, does it matter whether the number was 130 or 150? The answer is no. Okay? If a, the difference between 100 and 1,000, yes, we're talking about a different scale of an event. But normally after a number of hours, or certainly by morning, there's the picture. That's, that's the point where the CNN crowd, all of them, right? Stay tuned for this breaking story. There are still seven people in critical condition. Sorry. I feel for them. But unless I know who they are, that doesn't change the news. In other words, there's a certain point Bomb goes off in wherever. Stay tuned for this breaking story. Sorry, there's no breaking story. The only breaking story in Paris was the hostage story. That's ongoing. Once it was over, it was also over. Those are the things, and, and the Paris one was a huge complex event. Right? Those are the things that we need to sort of train ourselves in watching and, and looking at the news. Okay, I read four or five different versions. I can usually get the picture, and that's all I need. When they start speculating who and what and when and there, I can also tell you from experience, they have no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> and for a very good reason. Because the people who are really dealing with it have no clue at this point. We have become, thanks to TV shows and the news, we've come to the point where our expectations are that all problems will be solved in an hour. Right? Right? And see, I guess, right? Hey, if you don't solve it in an hour, then you're not really very good at it, are you? Okay? But it really, it, it, it works on us in the sense, what do you mean you don't have an answer in an hour? Got to go on to the next show. And that new sense of it's all immediate. And I'll, I'll give you an idea of how they, how they played out on us. I mean, you can do this at home, it's totally perfectly safe. Pick up any newspaper, it works with TV news.